Welcome to the Painting Lines Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things tennis. Join Eric and Aiden in their discussion for updates on news and pop culture, and from hot takes to betting, they've got you covered. Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week we talked about Rublev winning the Monte Carlo Masters, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about four players that are kind of in a downward trajectory in their career and uh, why we think that is. So kind of giving a backdrop for this, after living in like an era where the big three had this sort of impossible longevity and they were great for so long, it kind of seems like there's a little bit of reality setting in with some of these younger players. Not everybody can stay at the top as long as the big three did because they were such an anomaly. There's really four that came to mind for us. So we're going to start with Denis Shapovalov and why we think he's sort of on that downward trajectory for his career. Yeah, definitely. This is a pretty interesting topic, too, just because I feel like not a lot of people talk about players that have peaked. Um, You know, it's kind of a weird thing to talk about, right? Usually you talk about players who are on the upward trajectory and ones that are, you know, maybe peaking like we've done in the past. So I do like this topic. It kind of switches things up. And um, starting things off with Dennis Shapovalov, um, I used to love this guy. You know, I remember being in college, watching his highlights. Um, 2019, he, you know, had his breakout year, won his first title, age of 20, in Stockholm, which he was playing Tommy Paul in 2020, where Tommy Paul beat him there. So it's pretty interesting that he couldn't um, hold this title, but... Yeah, and then he defeated Nadal back in 2017 at the Canadian Open. Um, so, you know, watching this guy then, you think, all right, he's going to be the next best thing. He's he's on his way. He's going to be a top player, probably top, you know, Canadian player. But then um, 2020 reached his career high ranking of number 10, and we have not seen him since. I think that's partially because of just like his wild play style, you know? Um, he's very, he's a loose cannon watching him play is very frustrating, but almost artistic at the same time. Cause he's got that one handed backhand that looks so graceful. He's got a heavy, heavy topspin, uh, forehand and he's got a nice serve too. He's got that lefty lean. He's got a huge torso lean and he can really rip it. But, um, I think that's his Achilles heel, just how you know, wild he is. Yeah, I mean, it is one of those things where you don't see that many players go for the jumping one-hand backhand. Mm -hmm. And that's a shot that you see from him, and it's a spectacular shot to see, but it really shows how his style is based around going for those aggressive shots, which aren't necessarily the most consistent to go for. Uh, Mm -hmm. Looking back at what you said about him beating Nadal in 2017, I wonder if that was kind of the standard that we looked at these younger generations uh, that we looked for in in the younger generation of players, if they could beat the big three, because Mm -hmm. I'm assuming when, when he beat Nadal, people were writing about how he was, Oh, he's a wonder kid. He's 18. He beat Nadal. This guy's going to be the next big thing. But I wonder if that almost sets up too high of expectations. It could, because you see people like, like curious, curious beat all the big three, but I wonder if those expectations that were placed on him because there were, people were like, oh, he's he's that level of player. If those impacted him negatively as he grew into the player that he would eventually become. Yeah, that that's a good point. I never really thought of before. But um, the thing about Dennis is I think he is capable of beating any player on tour right now. He has raw talent. If he is totally locked in, zoned in for the whole match, I can see him beating an Alcaraz. I can see him beating Medvedev. I can even see him beating Djokovic. Like, he is there, but I think it's just a mental thing. I think he makes too many unforced errors. He double faults way too many times per match, and maybe he's just not getting the right coaching. That could be an impact. I wonder I wonder if we're going to see a trend in these players we talk, we're talking about of how much the mental game is a huge part of their sort of downward trajectory because I think if a player can develop successfully in, in their mentality as they get older, 
they're going to develop into a better player. But if their mentality stays in a sort of, I don't want to say a victim mindset, but a negative mindset about, oh, I should be doing better. I should be playing well. Then that probably just sort of builds on itself and pushes them down further. Yeah. So do you think a player, because he's very um, eccentric when he plays, do you think that signifies a weak mindset? Like if someone's yelling all the time, if they're clearly showing frustration on the court? Well, I think I think the thing about showing f- frustration on the court, it can help someone to let emotions out sometimes, but you can't let those emotions get the best of you. And I think when you're being so open with them, some of the time the emotions do get the best of you. Even if you're just trying mm-hmm. to, like, like, when someone smashes a racket, there's a one in five chance that they smash the racket and then they come back and the, the smashing of the racket has calmed them down. Yeah. But four out of five times, they smash the racket and then they're just even more pissed off after they've smashed the racket. But in general, I would say that it's better to try to keep the emotions inside when you're on the court. Yeah, going off that, I believe... For some people, it does help, like a Nick Curious. Like, I think he kind of feeds off that that energy. But someone like Shapovalov, where it's clearly not working, like, he is one of the most um, loud players that I've seen on tour. And you kind of see, or you, you remember Bjorn Borg and Roger Federer, they, they had the most, you know, calm, composed, stoic playing style. But they weren't always like that. They tell stories where before, you know, Bjorn Borg was – he got kicked off the tour in Sweden. They're like, no, we can't have you. You are, you're just not well behaved. And then from that moment on, he changed. And, you know, now he has that reputation for being calm and collective. Same thing with Roger Federer. Apparently he was a nuisance, right? He was, yeah, when he was a junior player. Right. Exactly. And then there was that turning point where he changed his attitude, changed his playing style. And I think that's what Dennis needs to do. If he wants to be great, Unfortunately, he's kind of a he's kind of older right now. He's uh 24. I don't see him turning that around. Therefore, I think he's already peaked. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is I think people would would argue with us and say, "Oh, he's still what ranked 20 in the top 30 players in the world. How could he be uh have already peaked?" But you have to consider that there are people out there like Grigor Dimitrov who is still ranked in like the top 20 or 30 players in the world. But you have to say that he's peaked and he, no one really thinks Dimitrov is going to win a slam. Nobody thinks he's going to win a big tournament. Even though he's still a great player, same thing with Shapovalov. Shapovalov, I don't really know how to pronounce it correctly. Shapovalov. Shapovalov. Yeah. I think he's going to continue to be a good player, but I don't think he's going to continue that upward sort of uh momentum that people thought he had when he reached his peak in 2019 Mm -hmm. so he's probably going to be one of those limbo players where you know he'll ride out you'll see him in tournaments yeah Yeah, you'll see him in tournaments and you'll see him do well but you won't expect him to be in the in the semis Mm -hmm. in the final no 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 no. but I, i do see a couple upsets in the future you know like i said i think he's capable of beating anyone on tour so like yeah, he'll you'll see some flashes of him, but he's uh he'll make a nice living play t- playing tennis, but he will never be as good as he was. Yeah. All right, let's move on to team. Yeah. What what, team. what are your thoughts on team? Cuz I know I think we differ on these. For me, I think that team is in a situation where he really probably hit his peak in terms of talent in a similar time as Shapovalov because he was in what two finals in 2018 and 2019 uh, at Grand Slams and then he eventually won in 2020 Eh, a little bit of an asterisk in my mind but he he's a player where since then he hasn't really shown a massive amount of promise for the future I mean he's getting older and you don't see him making good runs at tournaments anymore. I mean, he lost in the first round multiple times in a row uh, in the past few tournaments. He made a decent run. Where was it? Estero? Yeah. But then after that... In the beginning of clay court. Yeah, he he beat, I think, Shelton 
Mm-hmm. But then he lost in, I think, the quarters to maybe Hallis. And yeah. it, it wasn't really... Even though he was able to string together a couple of good matches, you didn't really see... You didn't ex- have that expectation that he was going to win the tournament. Yeah, no, I remember that match because that was my bet of the week. I was taking Shelton, and of course he didn't win. Classic. But I don't know. I, see, I could see an Agassi-type story out of team where he had a few years of struggling, went down to the uh, the challengers, played a couple of those. I don't think he's done. I wouldn't rule him out yet. I, I think he's got... Hmm... Do I think he has a slam in him? No, but I do think that he will reach a higher career ranking than he previously did. Well, and I okay. think it's it's a slow climb. I don't know. I don't. That's that's a tough thing to say because he was ranked like number three in the world at one point. Yeah, I could see him. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe make it under the top twenty again. Okay, I, so maybe. I don't see yeah. him making the top mm-hmm. five or top ten. So you think he hit his highest peak, but do you think he has another like I think small peak in him? The thing or, about uh... it is I think that every player on tour has the potential. Like all these these top players that we're discussing have the potential to play at whatever level they did before, obviously. I mean, well, hypothetically. I, I disagree. I disagree. At, top, at number three, but I think he's older. I think he's uh has a lot of mental sort of obstructions that are difficult for any player to overcome. And I think that means that he's n- even if he goes up back up in ranking, I don't think he's, we're going to see him in the top five or 10. Okay. Maybe not in the five, the top five or 10, but I do think compared to Dennis Shapovalov, I think he's on an upward trajectory where team had a hard crash, right? And then he's slowly climbing his way up. We're seeing promising signs. He is doing a lot better. So I think he's more of like a like a you where he is coming up, whereas Dennis wasn't so much of a crash, more of like a steady decline and then a plateau where like you're not really seeing he didn't have as hard of a crash. So I don't think there's as much of a a build up for him. Where I think team has the potential for a bigger comeback because he fell so hard. Yeah, but I mean there is there is a situation where like you like you brought up Agassi. I mean mm-hmm. we both read his book. We talked you talked about how he was in sort of a slump for a while. Why would why would you say that team has more of a potential of breaking out of a slump like that versus Shapovalov? Because a mm-hmm. slump can affect both guys equally. Mm-hmm. I think I think team's mentally tougher than Shapovalov. I think the way team plays, he's not a loose cannon. First of all, like he's very calculated in his shots. He has great fundamentals. He's not screaming his lungs out on court. He's a very professional attitude, and I think he knows. Like he's he's. I think he's more mature than Shapovalov, and I think he knows what it takes to get back to where he was. He won a Grand Slam final. Shapovalov never has done that. And team actually came back two sets to love in a Grand Slam final. I think he has what it takes. And I think the fact that he's tasted that before and he's his highs are high and his lows are low. And he knows what both feel like. And I think that he's the type of guy that is itching to get back to where he was. Whereas Dennis, he's never tasted anywhere close to as much success as team has so he's not he doesn't have as much skin in the game i think he's kind of just like yeah you know i'm I'm playing professional tennis i'm making good money but i think team i think it's more about the actual um status and like appreciation for the game and getting to where he wants to be that's that's my opinion okay i mean Mm -hmm. i think it's a uh an interesting, an interesting position. What, right, what do you well, think about the guy that uh, team beat in the beat. Grand Slam final? Zverev. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I don't know if his best tennis is behind him or if he's just getting started. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely in a in a weird spot because he was he was coming up when the big three were in in charge of tennis. 
Mm -hmm. And now he's still a top player. And you have to wonder whether the flashes you saw when he won the uh, ATP Tour finals in, what, 26, 2018? And then again in 2021. I mean, obviously he has that ability to play at this high the highest level and he he can he can be up there but mm-hmm. the question is i think for him whether the fact that he hasn't won a slam yet whether that is going to drag him down yeah because he's going to yeah. be he's going to be playing these tournaments against uh people like medvedev and alcaraz who have already won a slam and they know what that feels like and they're like oh i want another mm-hmm. one yeah. and zverev is like I've been struggling for such a long time and he, while he's found success, I think for a lot of top level players, the definition of success is if you win a slam or not. I agree. I mean, that's how I define success, at least for tennis players. But yeah, I think he's going to be one of those limbo players where he is playing great tennis. You know, there's no doubt about it. He is, you know, consistently making it pretty far in these tournaments but it's just a weird time where, yeah, like you said, he was coming up with the big three. The big three are kind of no longer a, a force to be reckoned with. But now you have a smaller big three coming up that's starting to win all these matches. So I think you'll see him continue to play great tennis, but I don't really see him making too much of a jump anymore. Like he'll always be someone that when they get him in the draw, they're like, oh, shoot, I got to play Zverev. But I don't think he's, you know, going to be... I don't think he's going to inspire the same level of fear for someone as, oh, I have to play Sinner, Mm -hmm. I have to play Alcaraz, I have to play Medvedev. They're going to be like, okay, again, I'm going to have to play against Zverev. It's going to be a tough match, but I think he's beatable. So in a way, I would argue that he has peaked then, at least when it comes to media attention and clout. Because remember when he was coming up and the big three were there, they were like, oh, next gen, next gen, Zverev. But yeah. I, I mean it. that, yeah, yeah that's kind of his, his big f- claim to fame now that he was part of the next gen that never really, you know, did found, anything. Never, never found mm. the, the slam success that people yeah. were hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it's hard to say in my opinion, like there is success in other ways. Like you can, he, mm-hmm. he, he had success in all these other tournaments, but he just didn't, he didn't break through at the slams like people were hoping for. Yeah, well, what do you think about his calling out of Medvedev? I know we talked about it last week, but I've been reading a little more about it. Like, I didn't realize that he called him the most unfair player on tour, like in the world, he said, actually. And that he's always doing stuff like this. And, like, you know, it's a shame. I don't know. He kind of dug into him deep. Well, I think Zverev was just mad that he lost, to be honest. <laughs> I think, I think. Every time someone feels they should have won a match and they lose, they're going to say something that is just out of anger and spite. I mean, it's like that press conference with Sitsipas and Kyrgios where mm-hmm. Sitsipas was like, oh, Kyrgios, he's such a bully on the court. And Kyrgios was like, what What was I doing that was such a, a bully thing? Like, that guy was actually just trying to hit me with the ball. Like, he's yeah. the one that was being the bully. And I think Sitsipas was just mad that he lost in that scenario. And I think Zverev was really just mad that he lost in this scenario. And it was mad that he lost to Medvedev because it's a player that he doesn't really like. Yeah, but how do you think that makes him look as a player? It, it, it's maybe not a good it, look. Maybe it's the uh, idea of no media is bad media. Yeah. No, he definitely likes being in the limelight. I can tell you that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be saying these outrageous comments. Yeah. I mean, people want to have that attention on them a lot of the time. And uh, if his only way of doing that is through making comments or stuff like that, I mean, it's just how it is. Yeah, I like it, though. Keeps it interesting. You know, now we got this pretty good rivalry going on. And I love Medvedev's response. You know, like he said, if there's a problem, he's going to have to come find him in the locker room and he can talk to him about it then. Yeah. So that'll keep it interesting. Exactly. All right. Let's get on to Berrettini. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about Berrettini, because I don't, I can't really speak too much on him, is he probably blew his only chance at a Grand Slam. 
against Djokovic and Wimbledon. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, and I think I think he hasn't just he just hasn't been playing at the same level since then. I mean, I think we we maybe aren't giving enough sort of credit to the mental toll that comes from being that close to like achieving your dream and then not not achieving it. Yeah. Like exactly. he he's at Wimbledon which is maybe the most iconic grand slam. He's, is I think so. Yeah, it 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 it, it is. I mean, the all, they're wearing all white. They got the mm. the the grass court. It's pretty iconic. Mm. Mm. And he has a good. He has a decent chance. I mean, it's it's his probably best service. I mean, he has a, a big every big server. I would say has the best chance of winning at Wimbledon. Yeah, the Italian hammer. Exactly, and and since since that he's had a lot of early exits. I mean. A lot of first and second round exits. He lost to uh, uh, Murray, I believe, at the Australian Open, and he he played in a challenger this year in Phoenix and wasn't even able to win that. So oh, that's that's really kind of showing the the level drop. I mean, obviously, all these players are professional players. Mm-hmm. It's a cha- yeah. it, but it, it's a challenger, and this guy has been around the top ten in the world. Mm-hmm. So you would expect him to kind of just blow through the field there and just isn't how it turned out. Yeah, he's on the older end too at 28. So yeah. Sorry exactly. to say he's I think he's he's peaked. You yeah, know, not really much. You pretty much hit the hit it right there, but yeah. It's unfortunate cuz he I think well, all right, these guys, yes. We know that they're not just going to crash hard, but like I said before, he's going to be one of those limbo players. Right? You know, he'll Go decent in these tournaments. He'll uh, he'll probably have some big wins eventually, but nothing slam worthy. Yeah, and I think I think the only thing that could really save these guys is all of them is the fact that they have been successful in the past, and because of that success, they have the resources to break through again. Mm-hmm. Because and you can get a new coach, you can get uh, entrances to big tournaments still because you're a big name, you're a big player. I feel like if if they hadn't had the success, like if they hadn't had quite the same level of success as they have, because there, there are definitely players that break through to like the top 25 maybe, but don't get to like the top 10 mm-hmm. that kind of just fade really quickly. And I think with these guys, because they were playing in the biggest matches, they could still maybe come back because they have the resources available. Right. No, that makes sense. And I think a big, you know, one thing that these players, maybe not Shapovalov, but at least teams Verev and Berrettini have all in common is injury. It's kind of just bad luck, you know? Like, they have been set back. Other players really haven't, or at least they haven't had the uh, severity of the injuries that they've had. So that's another thing that just takes a toll on you mentally. Like coming back from injury, it sucks. Because I'm sure when these guys are injured, you know, all they want to do is keep playing, and I'm sure they kind of push their bodies even more, and unfortunately, injure themselves more than they were before. Yeah, I mean, speaking of injury, like I mm-hmm. saw a name when I was looking at uh, looking through the betting for this week. Uh, I saw the name Kyle Edmund. Yeah, and that's a guy that was a top. 20 player i believe top 25 and i haven't seen his name in such a long time i was gonna say i haven't heard that i was looking at it and he had a 20 he had an injury that took him 21 months to come back from and it just it's just one of those things where i mean he had success but i don't know if he can break through again because he wasn't Mm -hmm. a guy where you were seeing him making like deep runs at every big tournament like some of these right. guys were. So it's right. like, is he going to run out of resources to help him get back to that level? Yeah, no. And I know Zverev, what's interesting about Zverev is when he was injured in Roland Garros last year, he, he was playing Nadal. And I'm, I don't know if he was winning or not, but I know he said that he was playing probably the best tennis of his life. He felt good in that match. And then, you know, he rolls over his ankle. Boom, he's out for seven months, eight months. So it's sad to see it, but it's part of the game. It happens. Can't really harp on it. 
Yeah, in summary, injuries suck. <laughs> All righty, you ready to get into segments? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, let's do it. So, betting. I'm going Dusan Lavachovic. No, Lajovic. <laughs> Dusan Lajovic. Minus 170 over Kubler. I like him in this match because he's coming off hot off that uh, Djokovic win. And I don't really know too much about Kubler. So, I think... Uh, he's uh, think... Australian, right? Couldn't tell you. <laughs> I just uh I've seen Dusan play in person and I'm kinda going off an emotional bet here. But and, and we'll see the, the momentum sort of. Oh, I also want to shout us out last week. We both hit our bets of the week. Oh Let's yeah. Go. I was pretty hyped. I mean betting for a three cent match <laughs> I felt like was a pretty bold bet on my end, but it, yeah. I mean it, mine it, was kind of a lock, so yeah. I don't I don't care. We'll take it. We'll take the little wins where we can yeah. get them. And I'm going for a second big uh, bold <laughs> bet this week. Man Reno plus 350 over Echeverry. Mm. The issue with this bet is that I think Man Reno is a player that is much stronger on hard court. And Echeverry made a run to, I believe, the final at ATP Houston. So he's yeah, he a. came out of nowhere. Yeah, he's a pretty strong clay court player, I'd yeah. say. I'm pretty sure he beat Tommy Paul. Exactly. So a yeah. strong clay court player versus a guy that's a little bit older. But Manorino's a wily player. I mean, he beat Shelton uh-uh. earlier this year. And <laughs> I think that we could have a similar situation here. I mean, Echeverry's pretty young. And uh, it's always tough to beat the uh, wily old fox in a uh, tournament. Mm. So I feel like Manorino and Strong in the same sentence just doesn't add up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, he's just a. a I've got to watch though. Yeah, he's just kind of a a guy where it's like he just never likes know. being out there. You never know. You never know what could happen with Manorino. Yeah, exactly. He's just happy to to be playing. I feel like he never really wins, or no, he wins, but he never really expects to go far. Yeah, exactly. And I also just think it's it's good value. I mean, plus three fifty for I think a betting on a player that I think is actually higher rated, like mm-hmm. higher ranked. Yeah. I, I think that's a relatively good bet. Yeah. All right. Let's get into match of the week. What was yours? So my match of the week was the Munich final uh, with Runa beating Van de Zenschulp. Kind of mm-hmm. tough name to pronounce, but Mouthful. he won uh, 6-4, 1-6. And then in the last set, he came back from being down 5-2. And ha- uh, his opponent had two match points, and then Runa came back and Whoa. won seven six in the tiebreak. So pretty intense match, and uh, kind of some drama with it that I'll get into in the uh, what's new for this week. Yeah, definitely. So my match of the week was City Pass over Musetti six four five seven six three. I like this match because I love the heavy hitting in here and the top spin. And then there's another point that I thought was pretty interesting where Musetti rips one at Sitsipas. And to me, it looked like he got the volley off, which I think he also thought he did too. But the umpire called it a double hit. And so he Ooh. lost that point. Yeah, I know. It was kind of a weird, like right out his body. Like maybe they didn't, I didn't really get a good camera angle from, but from what I saw, he might've gotten it off questionable. But anyway, Sitsi, that was a set point for Sitsipas. And then Musetti ended up, sorry, game point. And then um, Musetti ended up actually winning that game and then winning the set to force it to a third, but um, ended up falling ultimately. But great match overall. That's pretty intense. Yeah. What do you think about right. these these uh, Italian players? I feel like are playing pretty well recently. Like, other than Berrettini, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Musetti, yeah, Musetti and Sonigo, I think, have been playing very well recently, which is kind of out of nowhere considering like they aren't really like top, top players. But I mean, I've been seeing their names a lot at tournaments mm-hmm. in at least like the quarterfinals, making yeah. like pretty solid runs. I think these young guys are hungry. I think they sense an opportunity. You know, there's nothing established and they're trying to get up there. Like yeah. Berrettini is no longer top Italian. Like when you hear top Italian, I used to think Berrettini. Now I'm Sinner. 
And then, well, yeah, yeah, obviously. But then, like you said, those young guys, they're coming up. Who said he's on a go? I would even put them ahead of Berrettini. Yeah. I don't know how young they are, but like they definitely are, are in a better place in terms of momentum than, than mm-hmm. he is. But yeah, you ready to get into the uh, what's new? Yeah, let's see. What is new? All right, Djokovic withdraws from Madrid. So I thought this was interesting because this, that was th- since Madrid's inception, this will be the first time that none of the big three will be playing in it. Jeez. So we will get a nice foreshadow of what the future has to hold without the big three. But um, it also is kind of an iffy statement going into Roland Garros. Like, is Djokovic going to be ready to go by then? Is his elbow going to be fine? We don't know. Going to have to stay tuned. Hopefully, this is good for him to just rest up and then come in to Roland Garros ready to play. Hopefully, it's not a lingering thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, Nadal's expected. I didn't expect him to to play. But Djokovic, wow, that kind of caught my attention. Yeah, and I mean, it would be very interesting, actually, to see. I mean, if both of those guys aren't playing, that would be what uh, one of the first – grand slams in a long time that hasn't had any of the big three in it yeah yeah going if you went into Roland Garros and there was no Djokovic no Nadal you're it's literally it's it would be so wide open of a tournament Mm -hmm. I also feel like that would just sway the odds so heavily towards Alcaraz winning yeah yeah but all uh, right so Musetti's 21 and Sonigo's 27 just looked it up But Sonny looks so young. young, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Both I, I mean it's, it's that uh, that Italian skin, man. These jeans. They don't <laughs> yeah, age. exactly. Exactly. Just olive oil and yeah. And sun. Exactly. All right. What's yeah. so new my, for you? My what's new was as I mentioned in my uh, match of the week, Runa got actually got accused of faking an injury <laughs> in his match in the final. Uh oh my god. But to me, I think the accusations kind of seem a little unfounded. I mean, sometimes it looks like a guy's hurt. Sometimes it looks like a guy's down and out. I mean, if you watched the match with Alcaraz and Sinner in uh, Miami, it looked like Alcaraz was completely down and out, and it turned out it was just Mm -hmm. a cramp. And once he got some fluids in him, all of a sudden he was playing at a high level again. I think sometimes a player gets hurt, and they're just able to battle through it. And if – if that's how it goes, I mean, that's how it goes. Someone, you can't say, oh, he was faking an injury because he was able to battle through it. I think instead you should actually applaud the, the fact that he was able to work through this injury and still get the win. Yeah, but I can see the other end where this is kind of, this is kind of a way of saying, but maybe if someone, if a player was to fake an injury, then the goal is to kind of, make the other player think that they can take their foot on the off the gas, maybe take it easy. And then it's kind of like hustling someone. So like if you're playing pool and you're shooting like garbage and then you're like, Hey, let's, uh, let's bet on this next match. And then guys like, yeah, let's do it. And then you just come out and ball out. Then the other player thinks like that he got hustled and I can see where he's coming from because if I'm playing against someone and they're injured, then I'm almost going to kind of, play down to that level like i'm i'm not gonna i'm not gonna really give it my all because like what am i gonna enforce this on this injured player i i kind of agree with the whole faking injury thing like i don't i don't know if i uh i actually it's also runa runa is kind of an interesting player yeah i kind of i kind of disagree to be honest i think that i think that most players on the tour if they saw someone was injured they'd go okay i'm gonna try to exploit that injury to the max at, to a certain extent, like you've seen players try to play out matches where, say, like they yeah, can't I mean, even did run. you ever see? Did you see Chilich versus uh, Federer yeah. in 2017 in the Wimbledon final? Chilich mm-hmm. got injured, I think, in the second set, and in the third set, he was literally he just wanted to play out the match for the audience's sake. Yeah, <laughs> and it was like essentially over at that point, mm-hmm. but. I think I think you can tell when someone still has gas in the tank. So would you ever fake an injury? Fake an injury. Is- All right, faking is faking's a strong word. I would say 
say you're playing right your elbow's kind of hurting it's a little like you're feeling those vibrations you're definitely not going to quit but you're feeling it would you show like facial expressions would you be moping around would you like ring out your arm all that stuff or is do you think you're better off just ignoring that you know what i mean i think i think if you're not gonna if you're not gonna resign the match Mm -hmm. then i think there's no point in showing that you're injured yeah all right and that's the episode um let us know what you guys think are these players on the decline do they have a second peak in them uh let us know thanks for tuning in all right and that's the show if you're not already subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button you can find us on instagram tiktok youtube at painting lines podcast feel free to shoot us a dm or email us any questions or thoughts at painting lines podcast at gmail.com